we'll go ahead and just get started with some announcements. Certainly want to welcome everybody to uh, happy hour number 15. Hope everybody's having a good week. Um, April McDonald has a few announcements that she wanted me to run by you. We do uh, have in the upcoming week some special guests that will be joining us for the Durham Path Happy Hours. We're excited about that. Uh, we encourage you to go head over to sagesdx.com uh, front slash education for a calendar of events and uh, more detailed uh, review about uh, the next board review session that we're going to be hosting in October. <clears throat> uh, in anticipation of those of you who are taking the quorum exam, and maybe uh, those of you who want a, um, for those graduated third years who want uh, kind of just an additional uh, chance to look up some slides before the certification exam. Um, for those of you who attended the last board review that we gave in the end of May, first part of June, um, as of today, those review videos have been removed from our site, mainly because we're going to be using a lot of the same slides uh, for the next review in October, which we get some. Um, so please expect to receive more updates and be sure to sign up for the review by following the link uh, on the newsletter that you'll be getting. Uh, and then finally, as always, uh, the, these sessions are recorded. They'll be added to our Sages YouTube page. Uh, which now has over 12 hours of content for you to review. And uh, remember, in the comments section of each video, you can find the answers to each case. Uh, certainly, as always, uh, I'm available to answer any questions that you might have. I, I'm not real good about uh, fielding questions on the chat, uh, but we do go back and review the chat, uh, and those questions are forwarded to me, so I, I, I will email them the, uh, you the answers. Um, likewise, you can feel free to call me or text me. My cell phone is 210-416-4815. My email, I think, um, <clears throat> was just posted in the chat, so please feel free to, to reach out. We're always looking for uh, suggestions and way to, ways to improve, so if you guys have any ideas uh, or anything you'd like to see covered or you feel needs clarification, that would be uh, just great. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, and we're off. And uh, today we're going to be delving into the, into the uh, field or realm of granulomatous histiocytic disorders. Um, and uh, to that end, you know, in the broadest sense, any infiltrating the skin that's dominated by histiocytes is by definition uh, a granulum histiocytis. And we're going to be in today's session, as you know, from reviewing the slides, with uh, three palisaded granulomatous dermatitides uh, that have some overlapping histologic features. Uh, so we'll begin with slide one. Slide one was a bisected punch biopsy. Uh, this specimen was from the uh, trunk or proximal extremity. And you can see, uh, even at scanning magnification, within the upper dermis, there's a, a cellular infiltrate. Now, this cellular infiltrate is uh, really somewhat focal and patchy. And uh, by that, I mean that you can see some intervening normal collagen, uh, both below and adjacent uh, to the nodular infiltrate, especially in this, this particular half of the uh, biopsy specimen. Now, as we move to higher power, we can see we've got a basket we've cornified layer, and uh, the epidermis is largely unaffected. So uh, clinically, this lesion uh, most likely was a, a, a small papule with no scale. Uh, and we've got a nodular infiltrate within the dermis. As we move into higher power and see what cells are comprising the infiltrate, we can see a fair number of lymphocytes, these cells with small dark nuclei and uh, only a scant amount of cytoplasm. Uh, the dominant cell type here, however, uh, are, are these cells, and I'll go ahead and circle one, with slightly larger uh, round to oval nuclei and more abundant uh, pale staining cytoplasm. And these, of course, are histiocytes. Uh, some are um, uh, have one nuclei and some, uh, such as this one up here, 
are multinucleated. And the key to this diagnosis is uh, noting the distribution of the histiocytes. And if you look in uh, many areas, uh, here's a real nice example, you can see that the histiocytes are arranged in a palisade or ring-like fashion here uh, around collagen bundles that are separated from one another by this kind of acellular feathery pinkish blue material. And this is mucin. And it almost makes the collagen bundles look a little thick and little. These are normal appearing or normal sized collagen bundles. They're just being pushed aside uh, by the dermal mucin. Of course, we can highlight the dermal mucin with a colloidal iron or a um, alcium blue stain if it's stated bright blue. And then in other areas, the histiocytes are not so much arranged in a palisaded fashion, but if we look uh, over in this area, which I'll indicate with, the, uh, with my marker here, you can see that rather than, than uh, the histiocytes being arranged in a palisaded fashion, they're kind of dissecting as individual uh, cells between the collagen bundles and kind of separating them. And uh, this is a pattern that we frequently see in uh, GA as well. It's more of the interstitial granulomatous pattern. So you can see here uh, on the left side, I'll back out a little bit, on the left side, uh, a classic palisaded granuloma, and here more of the interstitial pattern of uh, granuloma annulari. Uh, and uh, of note, we do have intact collagen bundles. This collagen is not degenerated. There's no destruction of the collagen at GA, which is why when lesions of GA resolve, there's no scarring as there is in some other palisaded granuloma, such as uh, necrolysis, where you do get degeneration of the uh, collagen bundles. The lesions can be dispigmented. You may get some pigmentary comments, but there's no true scar formation. Uh, one of the key differentials here is necrobiosis lipoidica, uh, but as we'll see in the next uh, slide, uh, it is a condition which uh, is more dense and diffuse. It's not uh, focal and patchy. It tends to involve the entire dermis, top to bottom and side to side, with kind of these um, foci granulomatous inflammation that are arranged in horizontal uh, tiers. The other thing that sometimes enters into the differential diagnosis, especially if you've got an acral uh, solitary lesion of GA in a younger individual, is uh, a neoplastic process, notably epithelioid sarcoma. And it can really mimic a palisaded granulomatous dermatitis. But in that condition, there, uh, it's a biphasic tumor. So in addition to having epithelioid cells, you also have cells that are spindle. Generally, there is uh, a moderate amount of nuclear pleomorphism. If you search around, you're likely to see a few mitotic figures and some zones of necrosis. Um, the other thing about epithelioid sarcoma, you need to have a high index of suspicion for it, but it's got a very distinctive immunohistochemical profile in that it expresses both by men, which is typically a mesenchymal marker, and cytokeratin. Uh, so much, much less commonly encountered than GA, but uh, those are the differential considerations. So uh, again, backing out for GA, what we look for are histiocytes located in palisaded array or interstitially between collagen bundles and collagen bundles that are separated from one another by an increased amount of dermal mucin. GA can involve the subcutaneous tissue and it can even perforate. But for the most part, uh, it's a condition which tends to involve the upper and mid-dermis. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide number two. Uh, and let me go ahead and flip the slide. And slide number two is a punch biopsy. And uh, we can see a little bit of fat at the base of the biopsy specimen. And this is kind of characteristic of distal extremity. And uh, this is a biopsy from the lower leg. As we get in a little bit closer, you'll see there's also some nodular angioplasia. And then moving into, I may have to reload. Let me move in, I'm sorry about that. As we move into 
slightly higher power here, you can see that this biopsy is more squared off and than uh, the more tapered biopsy of the uh, first specimen. And you can see that this is kind of a dense, diffuse infiltrate. It's involving the dermis top to bottom and side to side, not, not focal and patchy like the last uh, biopsy. And as we move into higher power, you begin to see these horizontal pale areas. Uh, and these are kind of sandwiched between foci of granulomatous inflammation. And it almost is uh, present in a layered fashion. So we have granulomatous inflammation, these uh, homogenous degenerated uh, pink areas. This is degenerated collagen, another layer of granulomatous inflammation. It's kind of layered like bacon or lasagna. And if we look at the pink areas, you can see that there's actually degeneration of the uh, collagen here. It's not so easy to identify the individual collagen fibers uh, like we saw in uh, GA, and there's no mucin here uh, either. And then we've got these histiocytes in somewhat of a palisaded array in areas around these zones of degenerated collagen, but no, no intervening normal dermis top to bottom, side to side, extending down into the subcutaneous tissue. And then one other feature, which is very helpful in NLD, is the presence of these nodular uh, lymphoid infiltrates present around vessels of the deep vascular plexus. And if we go in and focus on this area, you'll see that not only are there lymphocytes present, but there are a whole lot of plasma cells with the eccentrically placed nucleus and the little clearing adjacent to the nucleus. And uh, deep plasma cells are a real common finding in necrobiosis like Wittigan. So again, uh, what we look for in uh, necrobiosis lipoiticum is more of a dense diffuse dermatitis, top to bottom, side to side, no intervening normal collagen, horizontal pale areas of degenerated collagen, kind of sandwiched uh, between layered granulomatous inflammation and plasma cells in the uh, deep dermis. Uh, definitely distinguishes that from a uh, granulum annulary, although there sometimes can be a lot of histologic overlap. And the third biopsy that we'll look at, also a uh, palisaded granulomatous dermatitis, is uh, definitely a little bit different. It's different in that it's a much deeper process. So here we have an incisional biopsy. This was actually from the uh, chest wall, and you can see uh, at best at scanning magnification, that this process is very deep. Rather than being centered predominantly in the dermis, it, it is largely centered in the subcutaneous tissue with a little extension into the lower reticular dermis. And as we move to higher power, what we see are kind of these X-shaped intersecting zones or bands of eosinophilic necrosis. And uh, this is a combination of necrosis and degenerated collagen. And it's surrounded by collections of epithelioid histiocytes by granulomatous inflammation. And when we look at the cells surrounding these uh, acellular pink zones, we begin to see uh, epithelioid histiocytes, uh, a lot of them are, uh, have only one nuclei, but uh, later we'll look around and you begin to see giant cells as well. In addition, there are neutrophils. And as we move into the zones of necrosis, we begin to see in these areas of necrosis and degenerated collagen, a lot of neutrophils and neutrophilic nuclear dust, giving this somewhat of a, a dirty appearance. This is what's referred to as dirty necrosis. And then in other areas, if we look in the uh, zones of degenerated collagen, we begin to see some cholesterol clefts, these little needle-shaped cholesterol clefts that are present throughout some of the necrotic areas. We've got some more cholesterol clefting here that I'll circle. 
And then in other areas, you know, if you start looking around, you begin to see some really large multinucleated epithelioid histiocytes. Some of these have wreath-shaped nuclei, others look more like foreign body giant cells, and occasionally in this condition, you can even get two-ton giant cells. Uh, and then at the periphery of the lesion, there's kind of a, an infiltrate here of lymphocytes, and again, a few plasma cells. So these changes with the X or broad X-shaped or intersecting bands of uh, collagen degeneration and necrosis and peripheral nodules of granulomatous inflammation with necrosis and cholesterol clefting is very characteristic of a necrobionic xanthogranuloma. Uh, necrobionic xanthogranuloma does have some histologic overlap with necrobiosis lipoidica, but it's much more robust. It tends to be deeper, oftentimes extending into the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, there are much broader zones of uh, necrosis and collagen degeneration, and you see dirty necrosis with neutrophilic nuclear debris in the uh, degenerated areas, which we typically do not see in NLD. Uh, in addition, there are more giant cells in necrotis, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma, more uh, uh, extensive cholesterol clefting, and as a whole, uh, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma is more cellular than necrobiosis lipoidica. It also has a different distribution clinically. Uh, as you're aware, NLD frequently occurs on the legs, can occur uh, most commonly on the anterior tibial surfaces. It can occur elsewhere on the legs, and occasionally uh, on the trunk, or rarely on the arms, but typically it's on the legs. And uh, a lot of the patients, of course, are diabetic. Um, NXG, on the other hand, frequently uh, involves the periocular uh, areas, and one sees papules and nodules that are yellowish brown and uh, that at times will ulcerate. Um, it may occasionally involve the trunk, uh, as we see in this particular case, uh, and it's a condition, of course, which uh, tends to be associated with uh, an IgG, usually kappa para paraproteinemia. So, uh, what we look for, again, with NXG are these broad zones of collagen degeneration, which are uh, characterized by dirty necrosis and surrounding uh, nodules of granulomatous inflammation, usually lots of giant cells, and look for the uh, cholesterol clefting, clefting as well. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to slide four. Get the cursor over there. Let me go ahead and flip the slide. And uh, we have a bisected punch biopsy here from the trunk. And one can see within the upper half of the dermis, uh, extending very close to the dermal epidermal junction, a nodular infiltrate. Uh, there's no real epidermal change. The epidermis is a little thinned with the effacement of the reedy ridge pattern. And what we've got in the dermis are nodular collections of epithelioid histiocytes forming very tight balls or clusters. Uh, a lot of the um, histiocytes have only one nuclei. Some, uh, as you can see in the left half of the field, uh, are multinucleated. Note that uh, there is no uh, infiltrate of mononuclear cells surrounding uh, these collections of epithelioid histiocytes and no necrosis. These are naked granulomas or sarcoidal granulomas, and this is a case of uh, cutaneous uh, sarcoidosis. Now, uh, as a dermatopathologist for us, making the diagnosis of sarcoidosis is, is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. So if we see a biopsy like this, even though we're thinking, you know, this is pretty good for sarcoid, we're going to go ahead and stain it up with um, AFB or bite stains, PAS and GMS to rule out infectious organisms. Uh, we'll go ahead and polarize the sections, examine them with routine and polarized light, looking for form material. And clearly, just because you demonstrate form material in a lesion with sarcoidal granulomas does not exclude cutaneous sarcoid, because sarcoid can localize to areas of scar and trauma and foreign bodies, so-called scar sarcoid or, or scarcoid. 
the differential diagnosis here uh, includes histologically some other conditions. Occasionally, cutaneous Crohn's disease uh, can give you sarcoidal granulomas. But those lesions tend to be perioral and perianal, and the patient should usually have symptomatic gastrointestinal disease. Um, Milkerson Rosenthal or chelitis granulomatosis can be associated with sarcoidal granulomas, but the lesions uh, are commonly located on the lips uh, rather than uh, on the trunk, as this place is. Uh, rarely, uh, rosacea can give you a sarcoidal granuloma, so usually they're more tuberculoid with a cup of mononuclear cells, but they're characteristically perifollicular in distribution. And finally, uh, exposure to zirconium or beryllium can produce sarcoidal granulomas. One has to have a high index of suspicion uh, to make that diagnosis. And usually there's an exposure history and um, you have to kind of confirm the diagnosis with spectrographic uh, analysis. Uh, and, but that being said, you know, we get a biopsy like this, we're going to suggest the possibility of cutaneous sarcoidosis and recommend a correlation with history and, of course, appropriate radiographic uh, studies and sometimes high exam. But with uh, cutaneous sarcoidosis, we do like to see these uh, tight collections of epithelioid histiocytes with no uh, cuff of mononuclear cells. So burn this in your brain as a picture of a naked or sarcoidal uh, granuloma. Slide number five is something uh, different altogether. Uh, the action, obviously, for those of you who've taken a look at the slide, is in the uh, left half of the biopsy specimen. But uh, that being said, I'd like to focus on the right uh, piece for a little, for a few minutes anyway, because it's it's kind of a nice demonstration of the changes we see on facial skin. Um, you can see we have a fairly high concentration of well, follicular units and a fairly large sebaceous gland. And if we look down in the dermis, we can see we've got skeletal muscle embedded in the particular dermis. And uh, we tend to see that uh, on the face and on the neck. Uh, the muscles of mimetic expression, including the platysma, do insert into the dermis. So if you see skeletal muscle, in the dermis, you're dealing with face or neck skin. And obviously what we've got uh, here, what catches your eyes, the striking acellular zone filling much of the dermis. Uh, and we have the peripheral edge of it here. Of course, we're looking at a two-dimensional ball of inflammation. And depending on where we section it uh, and split it, um, we're going to see uh, a bigger circle or a smaller circle. And um, this inflammatory impulse right here is, is perifollicular in distribution. And if we look, uh, we've got this broad pink acellular uh, area of caseation necrosis, and it's surrounded by uh, an infiltrate of epithelioid histiocytes, many of which are uh, multinucleated. And I will tell you that. Uh, Fight and AFB stains in this case were stone cold negative. And this is an example of lupus miliarius disseminata spatiae or acne agmanata, a condition which uh, most, most dermatopathologists view as a variant of rosacea. Most of the patients present with yellow brown papules uh, on the face, but I tell you, histologically, this is a dead ringer for miliary tuberculosis. So if you see this, I mean, you're obligated. Uh, to get bug stains to rule out cutaneous TB. Uh, but again, clinically, the patients usually have these, these papules uh, on the face, and it tends to show a predilection for uh, younger individuals. So a beautiful example of uh, lupus miliaris disseminatus fasciae. Uh, going ahead and moving on to slide six. Slide six, slide seven, and slide eight kind of all go together. And uh, you can see in this uh, specimen, we've got a bisected shape biopsy. Uh, as we move into higher power, you can see that we've kind of got a nodular or a dense diffuse infiltrate of cells filling the dermis. The epidermis is kind of thinned with the effacement of the Reedy Ridge pattern, a pretty crisp DEJ. And as we start moving to higher power, see that we've kind of got a mixed cell infiltrate here. There's some RBCs, probably a sprinkling of lymphocytes here. But for the most part, 
we've kind of got a sea of histiocytes filling the dermis. As we start looking uh, at these histiocytes, we can see that some of them are clearly uh, lipidized. So let me go ahead and get my pen here, and you can see that uh, some of these histiocytes, especially over on the right side of the specimen here, it's moving, the right side of the specimen here, contain lipid within their cytoplasm. And it, once you start seeing them, you'll notice that many of these cells have lipidized the cytoplasm. Uh, others are not, but, but a lot of them have lipid in their cytoplasm. Uh, there are lymphocytes within the infiltrate. Uh, in a few areas, there were rare eosinophils. And then as we start looking around, we begin to see these classic uh, Langerhans cells with a centrally located pink center, a peripheral rim of nuclei, and then lipid out of the periphery. Uh, here's another one, pink cytoplasm, nuclei kind of ringed, and uh, lipid out of the periphery. And the combination of lipidized histiocytes, two-ton giant cells, not Langerhans, I'm sorry, two-ton giant cells, I uh, misspoke there, uh, and uh, an infiltrate that's mixed with lymphocytes and a uh, few scattered eosinophils is uh, diagnostic of a xanthogranulomas. And as you are aware, xanthogranulomas can be solitary, they can be multiple, they can occur both in children and adults, they're more common in children. Uh, of course, in, in younger individuals, uh, JHJs, uh, if they're multiple and associated with neurofibromatosis, can also be associated with juvenile uh, CML. Uh, but uh, this is a very characteristic appearance of a xanthogranuloma. Now, uh, this is a fully developed xanthogranuloma. Early xanthogranulomas, frequently have a lot of uh, spindled histiocytes, histiocytes with more spindle-shaped nuclei. And over time, the uh, histiocytes begin to accumulate more lipid. And when they do, the lesions clinically kind of turn color from reddish, early JHGs are typically uh, reddish to reddish orange, and then they become progressively more yellow. Uh, as the histiocytes accumulate lipid, and then finally one sees the uh, development of, of the classic two-ton giant cells. So the picture will change over time. And over time, we tend to get more lymphocytes and eosinophils uh, joining the party as well. So again, dome-shaped papule, sea of histiocytes, and what you want to see with this anthogranuloma are lipidized histiocytes, uh, usually some two-ton giant cells and uh, a mixture of inflammatory cells. Slide seven. Um, is an entity that bears, at first blush, quite a bit of similarity to the entity that we just looked at, tags G. And uh, one can see here that we've got a sectioned shade biopsy, trisected uh, shade biopsy, kind of a scoop shape. And uh, again, a very cellular nodular infiltrate within the dermis. The epidermis is somewhat thinned with the effacement of the reedy ridge pattern. And as we move to higher power, we can again see that we've got lots and lots of histiocytes, kind of a sea of histiocytes. But in this particular instance, uh, there are uh, more inflammatory cells, there's more of a robust inflammatory cell infiltrate. So we've got a lot of neutrophils here. Get my pen, a lot of neutrophils here, and there are a fair number of eosinophils admixed in. And then when we look at these histiocytes, we can see that they have a distinct appearance. These histiocytes are all two-toned. And by that, I mean that they have both light and dark areas within their cytoplasm. In addition, most of them are multinucleated. You know, they have anywhere from two to three to four to five, six nuclei. And if we look at the darker staining areas, we can see uh, that it has kind of this purplish color, and this has been uh, referred to as ground glass cytoplasm or dusty rose cytoplasm. These slides are a little heavy on the hematoxyl, so sometimes it's a little more pinkish or reddish, but clearly there's two-tone cytoplasm 
uh, here, multinucleated histiocytes that are not lipidized. And if you look at some of these histiocytes, they're almost embedded in a lacuna. And then we have this associated brisk infiltrate of lymphocytes, uh, numerous neutrophils, and eosinophils. And this histologic appearance is, is virtually diagnostic of a, a reticulohistiocytoma or a reticulohistiocytic granuloma. And like xanthogranulomas, these can occur in children and adults. They can be solitary, they can be multiple. Like xanthogranulomas, they're a form of non langerhan cell histiocytosis. Now, when they're multiple, they can be associated with systemic disease, especially in adults. And uh, occasionally, you'll, uh, patients with multicentric reticulohistiocytosis can get a mutilating or deforming arthritis with characteristic coral beading along the nail folds. And uh, in that particular group of patients, up to 10% of them uh, can have an underlying uh, malignancy. So reticulohistiocytic granuloma, it uh, differs from uh, xanthogranuloma in that you don't have lipidized histiocytes, you don't have two-ton giant cells, and you tend to have these distinctive multinucleated histiocytes with that two-tone cytoplasm with kind of like a round glass uh, appearance. And since we looked at a uh, couple of examples of non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis, I thought we needed to give, give Langerhans cell histiocytosis uh, a look at as well. We've got a bisected shape biopsy here, and we've got a nodular infiltrate present uh, within the dermis, uh, somewhat similar to the last uh, two slides. The epidermis is a little bit thin. If we move to higher power here, we can see that we've kind of got a, a polymorphous or mixed cell infiltrate. Lots of eosinophils here. You can see with their uh, bilobed nuclei and uh, orange cytoplasm. But the, uh, the predominant cell type has fairly abundant uh, pale staining cytoplasm. And uh, in addition, uh, these cells have kind of eccentric or off-center nuclei uh, that are uh, pale gray in color with a vesicular chromatin pattern. And if you look at the nuclei, uh, many of them are, are kind of uh, lobulated or, or grooved or notched. And some of them, you, know, you start looking around and you can really see some reniform nuclei here. And uh, these cells, of course, are, are Langerhans cells. And uh, when you see uh, these cells with abundant cytoplasm and reniform or grooved nuclei, few scattered eosinophils, uh, you know, you want to think about Langeron cell histiocytosis. And you can confirm the diagnosis with uh, S100 stain, CD1 stain, and uh, a CD207 or Langeron stain, uh, which will, will light up the, uh, the infiltrate. And of course, the lesions of Langerhans cell histiocytosis can occur uh, in children and in adults. And the prognosis is really dependent upon the age of the individual, the number of lesions, uh, the degree of visceral involvement, and you know, chiefly the degree of visceral dysfunction uh, resulting from uh, displacement of normal parenchyma. So this was a, a beautiful example, I think, of uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis in comparison to the, to the two cases of non-Langeron cell histiocytosis. Okay, we're gonna close out our discussion uh, today with four conditions uh, characterized by the accumulation of uh, lipidized uh, histiocytes, lipid-laden histiocytes, uh, foam, also known as foam cells or xanthoma cells. And uh, taking a look at the, our first biopsy, we can see we can see a uh, sectioned shape. I see this may have actually been uh, two lesions that were put in one bottle in each section. And, um, you know, one thing that, that really jumps out at you here is uh, the presence of all these vellus hair follicles. And again, it's always important to try and make an assessment of anatomic location. When you first look at a biopsy, we've got a lot of small vellus hair follicles, a very thin uh, epidermis a little bit of papillary dermal edema. And again, you look down at the base here and we see skeletal muscle 
embedded in the dermis. And this is eyelid skin and uh, the presence of numerous bell, bellus hair follicles, kind of a more loose edematous dermis, thinned epidermis, and of course, skeletal muscle, very characteristic of eyelid skin. And then if we look uh, in the dermis, uh, we've got these uh, nodular collections of histiocytes uh, containing lipid or foam, and this is a foam cell or a xanthoma cell. And what's distinctive about a xanthogranuloma is that the um, xanthoma cells tend to cluster. There's usually not much of an associated inflammatory infiltrate. And then some of the foam cells have one nuclei, some have two or three, some have four or more. And uh, to my eye, they kind of look like domino tiles. Uh, you know, domino tiles will have a different number of dots on them. And same thing with, uh, with the nuclei in, in a uh, xanthelasma. And uh, so with the xanthelasma, we see uh, lesions typically on the eyelid. We see these foam cells uh, with variable numbers of nuclei and not much of an inflammatory infiltrate. And of course, most patients with xanthelasma uh, will have, um, well, 50% of them will be normal white painting. Uh, so very characteristic appearance of uh, xanthelasma. But the only thing you might confuse it with would be something like a, a balloon cell nevus, but uh, there you've got melanocytes with clear staining cytoplasm. They're usually not multinucleated and they don't have lipid in their cytoplasm. They're more glycogenated cells. You could also think maybe about something like a clear cell syringoma, but there's no ductal structures here. Uh, these are histiocytes rather than, than glycogenated epithelial cells. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide 10. Slide 10 is a trisected shade biopsy. And uh, we can see within the dermis, uh, a nodular infiltrate here in the epidermis is largely uninvolved. And um, as we move to higher power, we can see that uh, we've got some histiocytes here. This is not coming into focus for a while. We'll give it a minute to, to see if it quits pixelating. But uh, clearly, there are foam cells within the infiltrate and a few scattered inflammatory cells. And then the clincher here in this particular case is the uh, presence here, again, let me stabilize the slide here, of uh, extracellular lipid. So we have extracellular lipid accumulating uh, and the presence of foam cells uh, in association with extracellular lipid and frequently an inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes and neutrophils is pathognomonic of an eruptive xanthoma. And the lipid is accumulating so fast that the, it's exceeding the phagocytic uh, capabilities of the, the uh, accompanying histic, histiocytic infiltrate. So uh, with an eruptive xanthoma, foam cells, usually a little bit more of a robust inflammatory infiltrate and the presence of extracellular lipid, and you've got the diagnosis of uh, an eruptive um, Slide number 11, entering the home stretch here. We've got a punch biopsy, uh, and uh, we've got a fair number of sebaceous glands here as well. So this was probably up near the head or neck. And we've got within the dermis a big fibrotic nodule. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of got fairly smooth borders in many areas. Let's go ahead and take a look down here as well. Kind of smooth borders. You can kind of draw a line around it. And as we move into higher power, we see a few thickened collagen bundles and fibroblast. And there are also some histiocytes, you know, round oval nuclei a fair amount of pink staining cytoplasm. So we've got this fibrohistiocytic proliferation. But you had to kind of hunt here. This is, this is kind of a subtle diagnosis. And when you do and look at it, the periphery, trying to find the best area here, you begin to see, I 
think it's actually up in the top piece, that in areas, there are scattered thumb cells. You have to kind of hunt around for them, but these look very much like the thumb cells and the other xanthomas we've been looking for. So we've got this fibrotic or fibrohistiocytic nodule with uh, variable numbers of foam cells here, not very many. And this is a very characteristic appearance for a tuber xanthoma. Now, tendinous xanthomas can look very, very similar, but uh, they tend to involve, of course, tendons, ligaments, and fascia uh, rather than the dermis. Uh, tuber xanthomas are frequently located on the elbows uh, and on the knees. And one thing that you might consider in the differential diagnosis here uh, would be a lipidized dermatofibroma. But again, you know, this had fairly smooth borders and not a lot of uh, collagen trapping. But if you had a partial biopsy, you know, and, uh, and I've had that happen before, and I, you know, I'll see something like this. I can't tell whether there's collagen trapping and there are bone cells there. And I'll usually say, hey, this could either be uh, a, uh, uh, a tuber symptom or a, a DF with some foam cells. And in that case, I'll usually recommend that a, a single lipid profile uh, be checked. But um, if you see a big fibrotic nodule, kind of look around. And if you see foam cells, you want to at least raise the possibility of a uh, tuber xanthoma. And then finally, the last case that we'll look at, it's one of my favorite diagnoses to make. It's again, one of these conditions where you've got a a useful tinctorial or, or color that can point you to the diagnosis. So we've got a shade biopsy here, and we have this dome-shaped papule, and it's got kind of a verrucous or papillated surface. And then if we start looking at the epidermis, we begin to see these uh, V-shaped uh, red to orange uh, perikeratotic columns that kind of dive down uh, into the epidermis. And there are some neutrophils here as well. These kind of look like flamethrowers. And anytime you see those in the setting of a dome-shaped papule that's papillomatous, you need to think about the possibility of a verruciform xanthoma and look in the dermal papillae. And here, enough, here, sure enough, we've got these foam cells present. Uh, within the dermal papillae. So uh, this is a verruciform xanthoma. The patients are normal lipemic. Um, and I think the thinking is that, that uh, the foam cells accumulate from damage possibly to the epidermal keratinocytes. These lesions um, can occur, commonly occur uh, uh, in the oral, re oral uh, location or in the general region, but they've been reported in other areas as well. Uh, some of them could be a lot more papillomatous, uh, but papillomatous surface, uh, epidermal hyperplasia, and then you get these characteristic uh, V-shaped or uh, orange to red wedges of perikeratosis containing neutrophils. You see those, look in the dermal papillae, uh, look for, for pump cells. So that kind of ends my uh, foray into granulomatous and histiocytic disorders. Hope you find it helpful. If you have any questions at all, please be uh, please please feel free to uh, text me or call me. And uh, appreciate your participation. Hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you.